that if I don't make this work, I'm going to have to go back to the nine to five and I wasn't going to be paid what I believed I was worth. And the only way to escape the nine to five or make more income is keep going to school, get into more debt, and then hopefully have enough experience to land the career that I wanted. So that I had a good understanding about very early on, but it was probably the, the most difficult thing, but I knew nothing else. That was Jasmine Mazarregos with Virtuity Financial Partners. Jasmine is a senior broker with Virtuity Financial Services who specializes in insurance and retirement accounts. She loves working with the community to provide financial knowledge on what works and what doesn't work for the people of Kern County. She's a first-generation Latina entrepreneur, and she is excited to share what she's learned and spread that wealth and information throughout the community. Welcome back to the Our Two Cents podcast, the show where your local professionals sit down with an array of guests to hear their story and impart some wisdom for both business and life improving skills. This is your place to hear business and community leaders discuss relevant topics that matter to you. All right. Welcome back to the Our Two Cents podcast. I am here with Amanda Giacomo, my co-host. This is Kyle Jones. And we are here with a not only a, uh, a special guest, but a, a new uh, tenant in our office, which we are going to uh, showcase what she does today and um, highlight some of her uh, practice areas. Um, and again, ultimately provide hopefully some good content to the listeners and members of our community. So we have joined us here today is Jasmine Mazarregos. Did I roll my R's good there? Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Um Tell us a little bit about your company and uh, how it started, uh, name of it, you know, what your background. Just kind of give us a little information, then we'll kind of drill some questions at you afterwards. Yeah, that's a great question. So my name is Jasmine, as Kyle mentioned, and I'm actually a financial broker here. But we act- So this office is going to be an extension to our main office, which is actually located in Woodland Hills, and we are partnered with Virtuity Financial Partners. Um, and fun fact that maybe you guys don't know, Marshall Falk, the Hall of Famer NFL player, is actually partnered with us. Um, and he partnered with us, not because he needs the money, but he saw the value in just being able to educate people on what they can do with money so his family doesn't ask him for money. So it's giving an opportunity to, to just teach them on what they can do um, to better their life. But like Ho mentioned, um, I'm new here. I really like it. And, and is, there, is there anything else? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so <laughs> we have questions. No. Yeah, a little bit. So you started at CSUB. I did. So you were born and raised in Bakersfield or no. moved here? Okay, so, but, so where did you grow up? Yeah, so I was actually born in Delano. I wouldn't necessarily say that I was raised there. I moved here really, really early on in life when my parents, um, my mom actually married my stepdad. So because of him, you know, I had a better opportunity to to just get here and grow, expand my life. Um, but I did go to Cal State Bakersfield. If you would have told me years ago that I would have went to Cal State Bakersfield, I would have never believed it. Hmm. Sometimes, you know, things happen and, and due to financial reasons, I did decide to stay. And yeah, I really liked my time there. And what did you major in? I actually majored in kinesiology with a concentration in allied health. The intention was to become a pharmacist. And then while my time at CCB, I also had my pharmacy technician license to get ahead and yeah, just get the experience that I, I thought I needed at the time. So from graduating, post-graduation, did you take another job somewhere or what really shifted to kind of where you're at today? That's yeah, because I think financial sector, financial world is a little bit different than the health world. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's a, it's a leap. So... Yeah. What, what prompted that change? It was a huge leap. It was like speaking another language for me. Um, I mean, I, I wanted to become a pharmacist for all all the good reasons, but also maybe the bad reasons. I really wanted to be, I mean, especially being first generation, when you look at these careers, you look at opportunity and sustainability um, and that you'll always have a job for the rest of your life. So that's kind of like why I went into the field. But um, I did have a passion for it. But the reason why I decided to pivot in my life later on is after working for the wonderful company as a clinical health coach and helping people with money, I wasn't necessarily making much more money myself. So there's a very big gap between people who work in the medical field and people who specialize in the medical field. And in order for you to specialize, you do have to go into a lot, a lot of debt, which was kind of the opposite intention that I had for my life and what I saw for myself. Um, so it wasn't really till pandemic hit and the country literally shut down that somebody approached me and was like, well, doesn't, you know, you have nothing to lose. Why don't you learn about financial literacy? And because of what happened in 2020, I learned so much about just the money and people and also specializing with working with the Latino community and seeing what their needs are um, and being able to fill the gap. But I tell people this, that if you you can be really good with money, but you do have to be great with money nowadays. I mean, the generations back then were very, very different than what what's happening right now. And maybe Amanda or maybe not yet when you have children or Kyle, if you have children, like 
it's just very, very different. The cost of living, and now I'm seeing, you know, it's very common to have two headphones sell off. Yeah. <laughs> for, <laughs> for those on audio only. <laughs> um, and now it's required to to have about almost two streams of income, you know, to be able to support a family yeah. nowadays. Mm-hmm. So I'm seeing so many things that I saw growing up, but it's just highlighted more now because of what happened during 2020. So a big transition, but it was a blessing in disguise. So it sounds like you had a full time job at Wonderful. Was you know questioning kind of life career which is crazy that they expect you to go to college and you know what you want to do in college anyways without getting some real life experience um so you got some real life experience and then decided you know right in the beginning of covid that you wanted to make a shift and so can you talk about how kind of challenging it is from going from a nine to five per se you know job stable job to then being an entrepreneur right in the middle of covid in a completely different industry than what you know you studied for yeah, that's a great question. And like, even now that you're mentioning it, like it just brought back memories. Um, I mean, I was really new. I did have a mentor at the time. I mean, he's still such a huge blessing in my life. So he still mentors me. Um, but he was in Canada at the time. So he was across the country. I couldn't see him. So it was it was interesting. But the most interesting part about it is, number one, coming from the entrepreneur, I mean, from a nine to five to an entrepreneur mindset. I think the if anybody's listening and you're and you're asking that for yourself, like, how can you do it? The best thing that I realized as early as possible was I had to be very clear on what I didn't want in life. So it wasn't that I had everything figured out and crystal clear. It's I know that if I don't make this work, I'm going to have to go back to the nine to five and I wasn't going to be paid what I believed I was worth. Um, And the only way to escape the nine to five or make more income is keep going to school, get into more debt, and then hopefully have enough experience to land the career that I wanted. So that I had a good understanding about very early on, but it was probably be the most difficult thing but i knew nothing else so in 95 my nine to five career was very short-lived and entrepreneurial path was very short-lived so i everything i was going through wasn't necessarily like i mean all of it was just difficult so i it, i guess i can say like i didn't really know anything else so how did you advertise or how, how did you because you know when you're essentially in the financial sector and doing 401ks, IRAs, um, term insurance, stuff like that. That's a lot of, in my opinion, even how I grew my business, face-to-face interactions, being in the community, building a reputation, and then people will follow. Um, how were you able, because we, I, I mean, we met during that time period and things like that. And we, we, from the community, we've known each other and, you know, your reputation stands for itself. So how are you able to build that during COVID, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, that's a great question. So because of the power of social media, I because I started during 2020, I didn't have like face to face interactions, but I fell in love with the process and like educating people about what I did. So if you guys go on my Instagram and you scroll long enough, you'll see me in my room talking about um, insurances and what it's been able to do for families. So we always live by saying it's like facts tell, stories sell. So I can tell you the facts about what I can do. But if I'm not educating you on like how it can benefit your life, most people don't see the value. So about 99% of my clientele comes from social media, truly, because I can tell people or like let them know a piece of information that's going to bring value to them. So every day I'll switch a topic from insurances to retirement accounts to um, what what help, what benefits should you have as an entrepreneur or if you're nine to five, what should you look for? And also something that we started adding in there, implementing, which is so important is just understanding if you're working so hard for your money, how can you leave it for the next generation? And that's really where trust come in. Um, the trust and legacy planning comes in. So at the end of the day, it's just giving examples and, and really showing people that I care. I didn't come from a lot of money. So myself, so I take, you know, when people do come to me and, and trust what I say, like I, I don't take it lightly. Um, because I know how difficult it is to work for something that you work so hard for. And then maybe somebody not give you um, maybe the value that you're looking for. So you said something earlier and I wanted to circle back to it quickly. You said that, you know, most people now need two streams of income to, to make it and raise a family. And, and I would argue that that's still not enough. You know, a lot of younger people, um, I don't want to age myself, but younger people that I associate with work with or, or colleagues or friends with, I see that as a struggle to even buy a house um, and you know, we have two successful people both working and, um, and, and with interest rates the way they are and, and no inventory here, at least locally, housing prices are still elevated. And so people who, you know, who are, have two streams of income still cannot afford to buy that first house. And, and, you know, I was always taught that, that that's how, you know, that's the first thing you do to start accumulating wealth, right? Is you, you own property, you own something and, um, you know, it's a fixed mortgage rate. And then as the prices go up, then your, your, you know, your mortgage still stays the same and then you're accumulate some equity and then maybe you borrow from that equity and refinance it and maybe take it cash out and put it out on a rental property or what, you know, just 
you know, stuff like that. And, and, and people now are having a hard time even making that first step of buying a home. Um, inflation, another thing, I mean, the cost of goods and services right now are, are, are through the roof. So, you know, having two streams of income is, 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 is nice. And it used to be kind of a benefit to get your leg up, but now it's, it's becoming a necessity, I think. And so, um, speaking to that in, in your financial literacy and how you educate people, how are you, um, advising people, to, as you said, be great with money and not good with money, given all that I just said. Yeah. And I really want to highlight something that you mentioned, Kyle, is you mentioned, hey, like growing up, we talked about buying assets and, and refinancing and using equity and, and transferring it. That was not something, because I do specialize with the Latino community. We don't have those conversations. If you graduate college, like that's already an expectation that you've met that maybe that's really all your parents wanted for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so buying a home is like extra. Like that's mm-hmm. a way if you do that, like you know, that's great for you. But my bare minimum is, can you graduate? Um, Because most people come here as first generation and that's something that the parents weren't able to do. So the first accomplishment is graduating. So thinking about buying a home is, unless your parents are entrepreneurial, it's not happening. Um, And I do mainly specialize in the Latino community in Bakersfield. So, Which is a large part of our community. It's not like we're talking about a fringe minority. It's it's a very large part of our community. Huge. And unfortunately, a lot of people are in the same boat. So if you feel alone, you're not. Um, most people make it take with two incomes. I'm seeing the average is like maybe five to six thousand dollars a month with two people working full time, um, take home so net, but still, it's like I know that's not enough. And mortgage, I mean, rent, be, I mean it, not mortgage or rent right now. I mean, you can it's ha- like three thousand, thirty two hundred yeah, yeah. for a f- single family home, right? Yeah, so, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. And so, a big pain point I talk about is like, can if God forbid you know somebody happens, like, could you still afford that payment? So that's something we bring up there. But um, to answer your question, Kyle, on what are we doing to be able to help people and be great with money? I mean, number one, we do have to talk about building your credit score a lot earlier in life. I mean, in the Hispanic community, we talk about, you know, don't open up credit cards. They're really, really bad. And most people, you know, if they listen to their parents, they're opening up their first credit card, maybe 24 or 25. But you do need years to establish that credit to have good credit. Um, That's number one. And teaching people, you know, the 30 percent utilization, like what does that mean? How can you maintain a good credit score? How can you keep your debt to income ratio low? Um, but I think a conversation that needs to be emphasized a lot earlier in life, which is what we do is we talk about increasing cash flow. Like as much as I love, you know, work, staying stable and staying comfortable. It's like you, if you focus on increasing cash flow, so many of your issues or, or financial concerns can be alleviated. And I think that's just something that we don't talk about in general. Like, Oh, Justin, how do I increase cash flow? Like, what can I do? So I think thankfully TikTok and Instagram has showed people like, you know, things that they can be doing on the side, but emphasizing the importance of that, keeping debt low. And then another thing that we're specializing in and educating people on is, you know, don't buy the nicest car as soon as mm. you can afford it. I think that's um, Live within your means. Yeah. Right. And I know it's so tempting if you're like right out of college, you're living at home, you're making good money, so to say, and you take out your dream car. And then later down the line, I've seen that their parents need them financially or their parents are going to be evicted and they can't afford to be there. And their kids are like, well, I have all these car payments. I can't even afford to qualify. My parents need me. So it's really, really difficult. But just h- helping people understand it very early on it before you're ready to buy a home is increasing cash flow, having a good, uh, down payment and really educating people what that looks like. I think some people think like a down payment's like five or six, you know, eight thousand dollars. But I always give a real life scenarios. If you want to buy a home for three hundred fifty thousand, okay, three point five percent of that plus a closing cost can mm-hmm. maybe be twenty twenty five thousand dollars, double or triple what they're thinking. Yeah, right. So giving them that realization, like it really does take a lot of money down, and it's okay. I know there's a lot of programs available right now, but I would rather my clients over prepare and have a really good understanding of what what they need versus. I'll figure it. I'll talk to Jasmine when I'm ready to think about it. I'm like, no, before you're ready, have an idea of what, what needs to happen. And then I can walk you through that. And then if they do struggle with a lot of debt, I mean, there's a couple of credit repair specialists that we work with. I try not to recommend, recommend them. I mean, my biggest goal is I, if I can teach you how to get out of debt, you'll never get in it again. Because um, right. it really sucks to pay it back. But I think once you learn your lesson, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to live below my means. I'm not going to swipe a credit card. But we did hit $1.1 trillion in consumer debt across the U.S. as of 2023. Yeah, so. Crazy. It's telling me that people swiping credit cards is a very normal behavior. And it's okay. It's just having an understanding of like, what does that actually mean for you? Um, and really just, yeah, living below, below your means. But I think a lot of people just don't even understand 30%. Like, hey, doesn't if I have a limit of 5,000, I have 5,000. Like, that's not, that's not, <laughs> that's not what it works. means. Right. Yeah. And so people, you know, they're hearing that for the first time. So, I mean, just helping them understand there is like tiny little baby steps. And then once they have a home, it's just how can you leave that legacy for somebody else? And I mean, it's an asset, but if nobody else is in your family is in a position to inherit it or to pay for it, you could leave somebody else with a huge financial burden, which you intended for good. But for somebody else, it's like, you know, worst nightmare. We're to the point now where like kids are saying, I don't even want this house. I can't even afford it. Right. Um, so just 
you know, and then I, I filled in the gap. So they'll talk about insurances. We'll talk about, you know, we have Kyle here for the estate planning. So there's a lot of things that you do have to do as adults to secure your wealth. And we specialize in that. But as far as like just getting your foot in the door, is just learning about, you know, saving and budgeting and, and really keeping your debt low before these. So decisions. is it hard when, you know, they can't afford a, a home because they're in that situation um, to then also be like, well, that extra money you do have a month put into a retirement. Do they, are they seeing the value right away or do you, are you having to kind of explain like, well, yeah, um, you know, putting it into a 401k, IRA, life insurance, medical a disability insurance, something like that, that's more beneficial than putting it aside for a house or do any of them question that? I try to do a little bit of both. So like, for example, whatever money they have, I try to focus on two to three goals at the same time, because unfortunately, if I only say, hey, put it into savings, it doesn't work out that way. Like Jasmine, something came up. Right. I'm like, okay, we'll put, we'll start with something, start something very small for retirement because, you know, unfortunately it is a habit you have to build. Nobody goes from not investing to putting $2,000 away. It's a muscle you, you create. So starting something is better than nothing starting an emerg- um, an emergency fund or starting a down payment. And then we actually help them open up a high yield savings so they understand, hey, this money is not for you to use. You got to kind of separate it from the money that you have as an emergency fund that's growing a little bit faster than what you'd be getting at the bank. And the good thing about it is people who see results are likely to stick to something. So with the high yield right. savings, every 30 days, you're going to see a little credit. So yep. it gets them motivated. They see progress and they stick to it. Um, so those tiny little things help. Uh, Which lot. for the younger generation is new because I mean for the last decade or so there has been no interest. I mean you there you know there was no such thing as five percent four percent on yeah. a savings account high yields or otherwise. Yeah. Um, and so for the younger generations they just knew that there basically was no such. I mean we had such a low inflation rate for a while and and money was free and tossed around and, and then that was you know exasperated over COVID where they really started printing money. Um, that the idea of being able to park some money in a savings account and get 5% for doing nothing. I realized that that used to be, you know, something that when I was younger, that was available. I know my parents, their first house had like a 17% interest rate on their home, but you can also get a 12% CD in the bank. Right. You know, but for the younger generations, whatever, I don't know what millennials or whatever you want to call them. That's something that's new and novel to them. And so one thing I want to ask you, and this may sound like a weird question, but growing up, I had, uh, a lot of Hispanic friends and, and their parents and like even them using a bank was was something that they paid everything in cash. Mm-hmm. They would get money orders to pay their bills. Is that something that's still prevalent in that community? And, and, and is that something that you struggle against to get that like that trust in, in, in banking institutions or credit card companies or, you know, uh, 401k brokerages, stuff like that? Is that a hard path to navigate or is that, that not, not really exist anymore? Mm, it's like that's a great question actually but it's like 50 50 so i would say there's like an age to it so like i would say anybody like 50 and above are still kind of has that old school mentality where they don't need you know so much it's kind of stashed away but as far as like the younger generation they have banks um especially like people who are serious about buying homes like you you now need paper trail right you have to have money in the bank for a certain period of time so um i think that's like it's it's becoming more normal as people to trust banks the problem that i'm having now is okay, now they're in the bank. How can I get them out of the bank? So teaching people about, okay, how can your money actually work for you? So that's kind of a transition I'm going through. I do have a lot of child support um, on their end. So like, for example, a fam- um, usually when I have clients come in, like they bring their kids and like a lot of people come in. So what I also do really well with is because I'm young and I'm able to relate to their kids who are not anywhere near maybe a position where they want to be. They take my advice just because I'm young. Um, I'm a homeowner. Actually, I'm buying my second property this year. So I've oh, been nice. able to do, yeah, a lot of things. But I use myself as a living example of like, if I can do it, you can do it too. So that buy support of their kids. But because their kids are all on board, the parents are like, well, you know, if you can be like her, you know, <laughs> I'm going to do whatever it takes. So, I mean, going back to like just experiences and like wh- how I can show them. Um, Rel- so it's like relatability is what you're, exactly. what you're going after. Yeah. Yeah. And I use myself as a prime example all the time because I would, I want people to know that it is possible. Like no matter how bad the economy is or, or what's going on, like you, you do have some form of control on what you do with your money and how much you make. And I know people are like, it's just the economy in whole. I'm like, it is, but there's some people doing really well right now. And there's some people who aren't, but it's just a matter of making the decision with education, education, applied knowledge anyway, is what really makes a big difference. So as long as I can, can guide people in the right direction and they, and they take me to action. I mean, their life can be changed around in the next six months. I think you're really combating, and not just you, even in my industry, culture differences, generational differences. Um, I mean, money was so taboo, people didn't want to discuss it. And, you know, I grew up also not in a situation where people were discussing wealth management, or I didn't know any of the things that I know now as a child growing up. It was all, I had to 
teach myself those things. Um, I didn't have somebody like, this is how you should be managing your money. Um, and even now when I'm in consultation with my clients, I don't do 401k IRAs, but I, I have kids who are clients who have kids that are in college. I'm like, well, did you take out loans? Well, yeah. Are you paying at least a hundred, two hundred dollars a month towards that loan right now? Once not growing interest, are you decreasing the principal or maybe they're in high school and they know that their child wants to go to college and, you know, partnering with you or somebody else to open up a 529 plan or, you know, really getting it. Hey, you need to start this young. Um, even recently, I think the banks have made it really simple now to do like a custodial card for their children where it helps um, build credit at a younger age. And then when they're 18, that credit gets transferred to them. Instead of like you said, I didn't have my first credit card till I was 24. Again, I live in I live in the generational cultural base that you did. I grew up poor with nothing. Um, I didn't even know that to buy a car, which I had money to go buy my car, that I needed to have a credit score because they wanted a comparable loan. I never had a loan before in my life. Um, and I was like, but I have cash. Well, no, that doesn't mean anything here. And so when I hit 24, I had a huge learning curve on like, well, I didn't realize, you know, you listen to um, – Dave Ramsey and he's like cash is king blah 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 and that's not the case anymore um cash is not king anymore obviously it helps you you know cash will helps you do different investment deals but on paper like you said if you don't have all these a trail of you know and good credit and all these different things you know you're not qualifying for any of those you know next financial moves so I think it's interesting because you're at a point where here especially in Kern County you're still dealing with those people who haven't had any of that education and having to tell them like yes we need to be slowly doing these things and like no one else has talked to you about that but like this is the best move and I think a lot similar to yourself I'm a little bit older than you not too much older than you but it's the same situation people look at my story and they're like well if I was able to do it you can do it I own multiple properties multiple businesses you know, I was able to sacrifice and do all these things. You can also do it. I'm in my early thirties, but all of my twenties, I didn't go to Cancun. I didn't do spring break. I used a 20, a 2003 car. Even two years after I graduated and was making money, I still drove that 2000. Right now I drive a 2016 and I can afford a thousand dollar payment on a brand new car, but I don't do it. I live way below my means because I know that I want to be at 50, you know, semi-retired and not have to deal with any of this. But that means sacrificing, not buying all the luxury clothes, not having the best new iPhone, not having the $700 car payment or $500 Camaro car payment. Um, but a lot of people just aren't willing to do that sacrifice. Um, and that's really what it is. You need to be taking, especially if you didn't have formal education while you were growing up and having those parents to help you, um, in your early twenties, you need to be making those sacrifices because you're not going to be there in your thirties or forties or fifties if you're not doing it in your twenties. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you highlighted so many different things. I mean, yeah, taking out the nice things, like, especially when you come from nothing, like you really want something nice to show mm -hmm. for it. Um, so I see that it happened a lot too. And I, I didn't know you took out your first credit card 24. Yeah. I did it at 18. And my parents were like, are you crazy? What are you trying to do? Buy a house? Well, I, I was told I credit cards are bad. Don't yeah. get don't get credit cards. You don't want to go into debt. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, I don't, I'll do everything cash. Well, I was a server. And proper use of credit cards are bad. Yeah. Right, right, right. But again, but, I didn't but, have yeah, formal. Right, my family right. never told me. I let my grandma raise me. My grandma's a stay-at-home mom. Never really had a job before. And, you know, she, when the time she was raising me, she was divorced from my grandpa. She was on herself still is by herself on social security making no money and i was just taught i wasn't taught about investing it wasn't taught about a credit card i was told don't get a credit card because look at all the credit card debt i have mm -hmm. you know all these things and so when by the time i graduated college and wanted to go buy my first car and things like that uh, which again just a used car um, I was like, oh, I didn't realize I had to have, you know, credit to do that. And so then I had to, I quickly was like, well, what are other things do I not know? Let's apply my college education, which is critical thinking and learning to financial. And then from there, that's really how I got into accounting, uh, which I could have gone the other way too, which is the 401k investment. But I thought it was awesome to work with people on budgeting, work with people on businesses on like, hey, what are we spending our cash flow, our profit margins and help them reach to the point where then they can make better 
wealth decisions. Um, but at age 24 is really when I decided to do all those things because it was a lack of, I didn't, I didn't know any of these things. Um, so pretty much from age 24 to I'm 34 now in 10 years, I was able to build wealth because I sacrificed, I taught myself and I really, you know, I, I mean, I work like crazy, multiple jobs, multiple things, but that's what I did to get to where I'm at today. Yeah. What prompted you at 18 to get a credit card? If that's something that you weren't taught as a, as a youngster or did you have a mentor or you just, what? No, I just, I think because of Instagram and everything was changing at the time. Like I just knew like everybody would talk about credit. I'm like, well, thankfully it worked in my favor that it it worked out really well. But I mean, my parents were not regulating me. They were just like, all right, well, you know, it's, it's in your name. So you can figure it out if anything bad happens. They didn't teach me anything about it. I just took it out. It was secured. I had 200 hour limit. You can't really mess it up. And I just started there and it was like a student credit card through Discover yeah. and then they increased it to a thousand. But so like it just baby steps, baby steps. I mean, you really can't mess it up like that. But I guess I was just a little rebel and I was so curious. Like I just really wanted to make money. And I think a lot of it came from like I saw my parents work so hard. They still do. So my parents actually had me as teenagers. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're very, very young. But when you see your parents sacrifice everything they have for you to be successful and like go and like move forward in life just to make them proud but part of a sense of it i am the oldest it's to give back to them like to retire them so i'm doing anything in my power to make sure that they're okay financially and i know that i'm going to be my parents retirement account and it's going to be the case for a lot of people in the hispanic community as well and it's not a bad thing but it's just prepare for it so you brought well i, I kind of want to get into a specific question um but before i do i i, I don't want to spend too much detail on every service that you, you provide um, because if anyone has any questions or want to reach out to you directly, they can they can do so. But can you, before I ask my pointed question, can you kind of just give us, which I don't think we've done, we've kind of glossed over it, but can you kind of point out the services that, that you provide? Um, and then I want to go into a few specific questions if you don't mind. Yeah. So um, I'll be specific because I can do almost anything and I promise and if I can, I can find somebody who can, but we do um, insurances. So all three, so you can have a term policy, you can have a whole life and you can have an index universal life. I am a broker, so I work with multiple different companies such as Nationwide, Voya. We work with Pacific Life, Athene, Global Atlantic, North American. I mean, just so many different companies to be able to meet your needs. But we also specialize in retirement accounts. So teaching people um, like not to have a Robin Hood, not to have Acorns, not to have, you know, these little apps that are coming out because we always say 90% of your wealth should be on a, a strict plan. Like there's, it's a longevity versus, hey, once 90% is on a plan, your 10% can go anywhere else you want. Um, but usually it's the opposite. So just guiding people on what works for them and what doesn't. And just educating them. Like if you have a pension, if you have a 401k, that's fine. Just having a better understanding of what how it works. What is it going to look like for you? And what is that possible tax liability going to look like for you long term? If we keep contributing to this account. And a big question I ask younger generations is, you know, most of these retirement accounts, you do have to wait till 15 and a half years old to be able to access this money without that 10% penalty. So, you know, when you're thinking about retirement, what does that look like for you? Are you okay with having to work till 60? Are you okay with having to work till 40? And it's okay if you're not, but what are we doing now to be able to like create that game plan? Um, but yeah, most people say they have 401k, they have no idea how it works and hopefully it's enough. But I tell people hope is not a financial plan because it's really difficult to plan for yourself financially, the less time you have. I always tell people this, it's time in the market, not timing the market. Right. So just stay there as long as possible and stick to something. It doesn't have to be elaborate with 10 different accounts with low balances. It's I'd rather have one, two, three solid accounts working for you that are highly funded. Um, but obviously we'll work our way there, but start something. Mm-hmm. Well, they never think about taxes either. So they put into a 401k thinking that's enough that it's gonna be for the retirement. And I'm like, well, that's exactly what you need to pay your bills but you didn't factor in that you also have to pay taxes. And at that point, which we don't know because of the news right now with social security benefits, they say there's not going to be there by 2020 or 2034, that social security is going to be gone is what they just announced last Mm -hmm. week. Um, But let's say social security is still there. You have social security money plus whatever pension, IRA, 401k, Robin hood, whatever you're doing collects together that goes into your adjustable gross income. You pay taxes on that. And what I get all the time is people not understanding that they still have to pay taxes on it. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, they've been told that they don't and it's not that much or even on their Social Security benefits that they don't have to. Um, And and there are certain social 
security benefits, I will say, that aren't taxable. But for the most part, it's all going into one pot and you're taxed on it. Especially everyone went and opened Robinhood during uh, COVID. And it's like the fourth question on a tax return. Like, do you have, do you exchange any currency and things like that? And I had so many clients before they came to me, like, I didn't, I never always said no. And I'm like, well, you have Robinhood. So how do you say no to this question? Like, you're, you're on the market, you're exchanging. They're like, well, I didn't realize I had to pay, I had to claim this, nor did I had to pay taxes on it. Mm-hmm. And so I think, that's a huge missing piece of it too, is that not only do you need to be putting away for your retirement to pay your bills, a lifestyle, like you said, the mortgage, or you take over your parents' house when they pass away, can you afford the mortgage and things like that? You also need to think about health insurance and health things at that point of your life, plus your taxes. And so there's all these things to plan for, which people, I, I don't see them talking about enough. No, that's, I have this conversation every single day and people are, are shocked that we tell them like you will have to pay taxes long term. And I ask them like, do you think taxes are going to increase or decrease later down the line? And they all say, you don't have to be a financial guru to say increase. They know that. But it's like, well, would you rather pay taxes now or later? And some say later until I educate them. Like, well, later means, you know, taxes on what you contributed, what your employer contributed, plus the interest. And at that point, it's the last time you're ever going to work again. Can you mm-hmm. afford to pay taxes on that right. at that age when you're not going to go back to work anymore? And when you paint that visual for them, they have a better understanding, but it's who's taking the time to be able to sit down with them and paint right. this scenario for them. And usually we, they don't even talk about the retirement account at all. And, and people just don't know how much they're contributing. And just, you know, the other thing to talk about is people aren't contributing enough. The account is one thing, but how much you're contributing has so much to do with where you'll be with where you'll be financially in the next 20, 30, 40 years and also assessing risk. Like, I'm not going to say you, it, it's perfect and you're going to, you know, be very, very wealthy long term. But if we go to war or something happens again, like the pandemic, can you afford to take on the risk that may happen? So just, you know, diversifying your portfolio is really, really important to me, although I do mainly go in, in, in the stock market. But um, I mean, there's so many other areas you can put your money, which we are advocates for. I'm never going to say that my way is the only way. Because it's not. So the, the question that I wanted to ask, and we talked with a little bit about this before starting the interview, was a long-term health um, as part of a life insurance product. And I, and I, I never heard of that before. I, I When I was kind of starting my professional career, it was always advice like, hey, you need to get long-term insurance as a standalone product when it used to be somewhat affordable. And then once they realized the cost of what they were started paying out on those, I, I think they misjudged the actuarials on that. And so now it's it, it, a standalone um, long-term care policy is just extremely, extremely expensive, but there's other options. And so can you, can you speak a little bit as to how those work and what that looks like? Yeah. So I can, I can talk about long-term care insurance because I didn't even know long-term care, care insurance was a thing because before working in financial services, but basically it's a paycheck that you can receive from a company, typically a life insurance company. If you cannot do two out of the six daily living activities, which can be bathing, making decisions, controlling bowel movements, um, walking from one point to point B, um, basic hygiene. There's one more, might be missing it, but any daily living activity. So if you can't do two out of the six and some companies are strict, well, they'll wait, make you wait three months or some are immediate. But if you're not able to do those, you are able to receive a paycheck um, until the long-term care policy is done or until you liquidate the entire account. Um, but it's going to alleviate and help you be able to hire either a family member or you can, you know, hire a skilled nursing professional or just have some form of help to come help you do, you know, basic living ne- living necessities. But um, yeah, Kyle, when you mentioned standalone, I'm like, oh, it's very rare that we do that because it's because the they're combined. Yeah. yeah. Now they're combined. So and I really want to emphasize this for the Hispanic community because 99 percent time the person who's going to take care of their parents uh, financially and physically is either the oldest daughter or the oldest child. I'm bold. So I take it very, very personal. It's like, I know I'm going to be that person financially. So I even took it upon myself. I actually opened up long-term care policies for my parents because I knew that the it was going to be on me uh, mm-hmm. financially long-term. So to be able to, you know, be proactive and, and help myself, really, I opened it up for them. But also my dad is a breadwinner. So if, if something really did happen to him, I don't, I don't know, it'd be much deeper than that. Not only just taking care of him, but like taking care of my mom as well. So, I mean, always protecting the main provider of the household and and anything that may happen because I think Kyle, we talked about earlier that the number one cause of bankruptcy is medical bills. Usually, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's really expensive and uh, the other thing we talk about is, you know, it, you told me that your mom, your grandma was 100. Yeah. 
I tell people. I saw that. your brain started spinning when when you heard that. You're like, wait a second, that's a lot it's of years really, to yeah, cover. Very shocking. I mean, in the Hispanic community, you don't really see a lot of people wait to live to 100. It's just not common. We pass away from a lot of illnesses, uh, cancers, um, stroke, heart attacks, and you know, diabetes, diabetes as, mm-hmm. and heart attacks, and like high blood pressure. Like, is really, really, really knocking us out a lot earlier than 100. Where if you can even make it to 80, like you're considered lucky. So teaching people, like we, there's a very high chance that we may pass away from you know a medical illness. So I, I'm a big advocate for teaching people long-term care, especially in the Hispanic community, because it's inevitable. I'm going to find something in my health, um, a little bit lifestyle, a little bit what we eat, but yeah, you know, it's in there. So just educating people. And, and I just, I honestly believe people don't have it enough because they don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily think the cost is like to turn them away. I just honestly, like I didn't even hear about it until I started working here. So if I feel that way, um, how many other people do too? And it's not only that, another thing that we talked about, and again, I think it's worth mentioning and kind of going a little bit of detail on and again if people want to you know find out further obviously contact you directly to get in you know, get into the weeds but another interesting thing was actually borrowing against your 401k um and for you know i i'm a little older than both you guys but but it's something i, I just didn't really know that people did until a really good friend of mine um was starting a franchise and and um i said oh you, you know you're taking a private loan out he's like no no i'm borrowing against my 401k and, and and it's just hearing him like how he's leveraging his retirement to start up a new business and a new franchise i was like that's you know that's that's unbelievable but i didn't know um that was commonly done until i think amanda even mentioned like you know you just kind of follow what what the quote-unquote wealthy are doing um to leverage their monies to leverage their assets and and you know help their financial situation and, and that's kind of what you're talking about right like what you're advocating or what you're trying to train or educate people on yeah, that's so funny, Kyle. So you may not believe this. I've never told you this. Um, so when the one thing Hispanics do know about is pulling out of their 401k. Okay. It's very, very, very common and it's really unfortunate, but I've had clients take out of their 401ks for quinceañeras. I've had people pull it out for trucks, sometimes medical bills, sometimes down payment for homes. Mm-hmm. So they do borrow against 401ks. Very rarely is it to like start a business or like create more generational wealth. It's usually right. because I'm low on cash. What financial else need right? and yeah and they will figure it out i'm very shocked i have grandmas grandpas come to me i'm like how did you do that so yeah if there's a will there's a way they'll figure it out but yeah it's pretty common i tried to advise against it i also i don't know maybe you guys against have taking it. a from 401k taking um, out of a 401k or loaning against the 401k loaning well usually depending on circumstances sometimes you can loan because they're not just willing to be like yeah sure everybody can take it out it's like sometimes you have to justify you're taking it out but if you don't want to justify it then yeah you can borrow against it some people do liquidate it and pay taxes, mm-hmm. um, but under certain circumstances, you have to be unemployed or um, terminated, or you, or you've been fired. Yeah. Well, you're, well, usually, I don't tell anyone to take out of the four hundred one k. I say take a loan against the four hundred one k because that's the better option. So you're saying the first option you don't ever tell them to take out of the four hundred one k is what you're saying? Yeah, never okay. take out. I mean, unless it's like less than five thousand and they're like rolling over. I'm like, well, just pay the taxes, start something new. Um, but it's it's very case by case. But I'm. I'm really against touching this money early because the intention of using this money is for like long-term gains. Right. But very rare do my clients come to me for like that long-term gains. It's like, I Mm. have a bill I got to pay for right now. And I'm also not for borrowing against your 401k to buy, uh, to purchase a home. And a lot of people who do use that money to be able to use as a down payment. But it's really difficult because if we couldn't afford the the house Mm. in the first place, like now you have a mortgage plus that loan you got to pay back. And I have clients even after feeling like, okay, maybe that wasn't the best decision. Okay, so you're, you're distinguishing sense. between taking it out for, you know, buy the house or maybe for a quinceanera or whatever, right, right. you know, but 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 to, to leverage it to for like another business or investment opportunity, that's something that you would advocate for if if, if, if someone's in the right financial position to do that. Yeah, absolutely. But okay. I'm just mentioning, guys, like it, that's really not the case. That's <laughs> that's rare. Yeah, Okay. it is. Like okay. to, when you mentioned like he did, he bought a franchise, like right. I don't see that often. Okay. Um. But if they were, then that'd be amazing. Right. Leveraging it for the right reasons. But right. usually it's... Okay. So you're saying it's rare to, 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 for someone to be in that situation to be able to leverage it for the right reason mm-hmm. as opposed to a quote-unquote necessity taking it out. Right. Okay. That makes sense. What about self-employed disability? I know that you and I have discussed that. I don't think a lot of self-employed mm. individuals um, really discuss this. And even with COVID... Um, you know, the government still gave those, you know, payouts, if you will, if you were self-employed, which they usually don't just for record. If you go unemployed when you're self-employed, you're not getting unemployment. That was just uh, during COVID that they changed that. So without getting unemployment or even, you know, you're having health insurance. Protections? 
the PPP loan? PPP? No. no. So if you were self-employed and you can prove that you were self-employed before COVID, there was unemployment for self-employed. Oh. I didn't know that either. Yeah. It was only during COVID that they offered mm. it and they took it back because it. they were saying that, again, like, how are they surviving? Um, because they weren't paying into any of these things. So that was a... And some self-employed individuals are getting confused because they think that, that now that happens all the time and that's not the case. So I know unemployment is a different, um, you know, beast that we can talk about. But for if you are the breadwinner in your family and you're self-employed and, and you get hurt on the job or you get sick and you need to take time off and you are actively working in the company, not having disability insurance or, um, you know, some type of insurance to help you during that time is going to hurt you because let's say you were bringing $5,000 a month in from your business. Let's just, you know, in this example, well, now you can't go uh, mow the lawn. You, you can't go meet the clients. You can't go do what you need to do physically because you're on bed rest. Um, you're losing out on $5,000 a month. So I don't think it's talked about enough with entrepreneurs that, unless you have a contingency planned or you have other staff that can pick up the slack while you're not there, um, you need to be really investing in that type of insurance as well. Correct? A hundred percent. I mean, when you're an entrepreneur, you have to f find everything yourself. You have your own health insurance, your life insurance, your own retirement accounts and disability. So it's all, you kind of have to find it. And so I do specialize working with people who are self-employed. It doesn't matter the skill. Um, we have multiple people with different licenses that I have to be able to give you guys the information that you need. Um, but what you're talking about, Amanda, is coming up all the time. And I think it's, I'm glad we're mentioning it here because most people, entrepreneurs are like, nothing's going to happen to me. I'll be fine. Like, we'll figure it out. But it's, you know. Use the opposite when, yeah. when shit hits the fan. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just having the conversations early and really looking into your options. Um, I personally don't do the disability, but I know somebody who does. But always be aware. I know something else that's coming up a lot that's hurting a lot of uh, female entrepreneurs is when they are on a or FMLA and not being able to get it because you're self-employed. Mm -hmm. So having a baby and not having enough income to take off. Yeah. Right. And I even know a couple local professionals who had babies and they, they're struggling in their businesses now because they took off maternity longer than expected. Inflation, when they got back, the cost of products just increased. So mm -hmm. it was a, a really difficult transition for them. And I never want somebody to maybe not consider having children because of I'm not going to be in a position for somebody else to take care of me. Well, or, now you, maybe you can't work as much either because right. now you're raising a child. And then so, again, if you were making 5000 a month, now you maybe you're only making 3000 And mm -hmm. so that's huge loss. So, yeah, I think it is important to for entrepreneurs to be, to be discussing that too, which they're not. I mean, my struggle when I'm with my entrepreneurs is, you know, budgeting taxes, but then also like, well, are you preparing for retirement? Cause you're not working for somebody where you're putting in and there's matching and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, then you have to throw in another, well, what, what happens if you get hurt? Well, that's just another thing now I have to pay for. And, and so that, that's kind of all that I hear from my clients is all just another thing I need to go do. But you know, that one's super important because, again, you are the only one making the money in, in the business um, and you get hurt or you have to go on disability or you have a child or something like that, you're going to be taken out of making that money. So mm -hmm. it's important to be discussing what your plans are for that. 100%, especially, I mean, especially if they're the breadwinner and that business is funding the entire household, that's really, really crucial. Um, I know that typically happens with a lot of like solar agents as well. I can think of like, you know, they come they come across a lot of money really quickly mm -hmm. and then they do provide for the whole family financially. But you know, solar is not, I don't know. It depends who you ask. If you ask a agent, they say it's great, but right. I'm like, well, if you ask somebody else, I'm like, Oh, for how long though? It's still an industry. Yeah. It's still, I mean, industries have ups and downs and right. right. Yeah. You have to yeah. prepare for it. Mm -hmm. So just having these conversations early on in life. Um, but I, I, I mean, cause some people do tell me like, I have to pay for something else, but it's like, what if something, so really painting that scenario of like, what really like walk me through the process of what that would look like for you if you were not to work for three months. Because I can tell them what they want. I can tell you everything. But I, I'm a firm believer of they tell me what like what's going to happen. And then they're more likely to like listen. Mm, like if sense. I say you need disability insurance. They're like no. I'm like well what do you think could happen? Mm. Or can you walk me through a process what that looked like if you got hurt? Well okay you're right. Maybe I'll do Then they'll it. tell you I probably need disability <laughs> yeah, insurance. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we I'm really really big on like people have to tell me what they want. Because yeah. nobody likes to be told what to do. But if you can, you know, guide the conversation and have them walk you through the process or their plans or maybe the lack of plan, like, hey, maybe this is a scenario we can actually emphasize on um, because of this. But it really comes down to like a lot of a lot of stories that you have to share. And I've seen a little bit of everything. And the other conversation to have is 
um, cause we do key managements too. Like there's people who own businesses and there's multiple owners. So having the conversation, like mm-hmm. what is that going to look like? And I can't, I can't do it alone. I can do key managers, but you do need an attorney and you also need a, um, you know, a tax professional on hand because it's not an easy transition just to say like, just sell everything. It's legal documentation, making decisions. If you are married, yeah. is your wife going to step in? Or are they not going to step in? What does the operating agreement say of the partnership? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. These are, it, it's a lot of mm-hmm. extra steps, but I mean, the, the beauty of entrepreneurship is there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad, but right. I don't look at this as a bad thing, but you have so many resources available if you're talking to the right people, but kind of having the conversation of like, if this, if do I plan on selling business, do I not, do I want to give it to my kids? If, yeah. Well, some of the operating agreements have where family members or wives can't take the share. Right. So, they, they sign off on it when they mm-hmm. enter into it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's really looking into those con. This is why, like you said, you should have a lawyer and you should have a tax professional there because usually the first document they need to be going is a joint venture agreement or an operating agreement. And they need to be reviewing what it says because some of them will say that the wife or the children can't take over. So if they're deceased, that does need to, that portion has to be sold or be split between the other owners. Um, so it's all part of a you know, major contract as well. But yeah, I mean, that's a huge, you know, you don't even think about that, like your partner is going to pass away, but the reality is it might happen. And those are things that you need to be discussing. And, and hopefully you discussed when you were forming the business and you formed, like I said, an agreement and you hired a lawyer to do that um, so that you have those questions already answered if something would happen. But a lot of times that's not the case. They they just go a legal Zoom or they do it themselves and they don't have an operating agreement or they don't have a joint venture agreement and then none of these things are laid out and that's what you're saying is like the huge headache now occurs because now you don't have what needs to be happening. Right. That's why it's so important to go to the financial planner as well. I mean, we, we, we kind of consider ourselves financial planners because we bring up everything. Even though I don't do a trust, I still bring it up because it's still part of a financial plan and creating a legacy for somebody else. So giving a lot of people scenarios and like what could go wrong, what, what really works for you. And just giving people examples of like something you should look into. Um, yeah. And, and honestly, that's kind of, you know, I keep, we had a meeting here in our office meeting, I don't know, two days ago or yesterday. I can't remember what time flies, but um, one of the things I keep going back to is um, ha- having like a team approach to, to everything is, is so important because there's, you know, we're inundated with so much information right now. Um, I mean, social media, uh, you know, Google, I mean, everyone's an attorney, everyone's a CPA, everyone's a financial planner, everyone's a plumber, everyone's, everyone's whatever they want to be right now because we have all this information in our access, which is good and bad. It's good if you can actually, you know, critically think and parcel out that information that you're getting and apply it in an appropriate manner. But it's also the, the other side of that sword is if you, if you, rely on some misinformation or something that's not accurate you can get yourself in a very bad situation so that's kind of like what i envision you know our office being for people um and and hopefully growing into is just having a spot where you know if you know if you have a question if if amanda can't answer answer it then then maybe kyle can if kyle can't then maybe jasmine can if jasmine can't then maybe scott can and so there, there there's just like a group of of people who um, have your best interests in, in, at heart and um, we'll find the resources um, that you need. And so I think, again, it, it's just a way to um, uh, provide a, a higher level of services for people. And mm-hmm. so I don't you know, I don't know if you, you agree with that necessarily or not, but I, I think it's very important to have that kind of team approach. Oh, I definitely agree. I mean, you need a team. Like Amanda can't do what I can do. What I can do, I can't do what you can do, right. vice versa. So you need multiple people who specialize in different areas to be able to create a good, solid financial plan. And I mean, Amanda have conversations like what works best with this person and, and so on. And then I, I know I've asked you personal questions on mm-hmm. personal injury and also the estate planning side. Like you just, you need somebody to specialize in kind of like Kyle mentioned, there's so much information and it's great information, but it may not be good for you. Right. right. That's what's really, really important. And I learned that during the pandemic. Um, there was a lot of great stuff out there and everything looked really good. But if you're not in the position to take on that advice, it could hurt you a lot. Um, you're not just you, but like your family and, and maybe your financial stability. Who knows? Um, but just being really careful with, you know, who you're asking and what question are you asking? Yeah, just, just real funny anecdote on that real quick. But during the pandemic, there was, I think it was TikTok, but there was something that was, was being published content wise that was just basically the message that people got from is you need to have an LLC yeah, and like craziness, everyone and their mom was forming an LLC or mm-hmm. coming to say, I need an LLC. I'm like, what for? I, I saw this TikTok video on this. I need an LLC. And it's like, well, not saying that he, I think it was a man who put this content out, but it wasn't as if he was giving bad information because for him it worked. And maybe for, 
you know, the fact pattern or situational pattern that someone was in, that LLC was a good fit, but but it wasn't like a one size fit all. And I just remember that. No, and also he like, didn't say that he lived in a different state and that in California owning an LLC costs you so much in fees plus right. minimum taxes, right. um, plus all you know, all these other regulations. Um, I mean, I see this every single day, especially this last tax season. You don't even know how many LLCs I had to help dissolve this right. last tax season. <laughs> Cause I'm like, you're a photographer and you open an LLC and you don't, I mean, they're grossing 50,000 in a year. They're netting 5,000 yep. if that. There's just absolutely no benefit. And there's no not, liability like, protection. And they're like, no. well, I heard I, uh, like, you know, it helps me from being sued. Well, did you think of getting just, you know, liability insurance? Right. Um, right. No. But also you're not in an industry that would be high risk. Well, I read something online that, you know, photographers can be sued, which is true. I've heard scenarios where if they go to film a, a wedding and for some reason the car got damaged, you know, the husband and wife can go sue them for the, you know, that value. But the value, I mean, the most expensive here in Baker so which I know in LA there might be a little bit higher and other areas might be higher, but five thousand dollars for a wedding is photography. Well, still you just made an LLC for a five possibly being sued for five thousand dollars. Yeah, business uh, liability insurance for yeah, that is what so, if, so business liability yeah. business li- uh, the insurance is a one million dollar aggregate. Yeah. I'm like, do you think you're going to get sued for more than $1 million? Well, versus no. paying $800 to the <laughs> yeah. Secretary of State every year versus paying Amanda, you know, six $700 to file a return or whatever, whatever that mm-hmm. cost is, right? Uh, you know, these are expenses that... Plus, you- if you're an LLC, you pay, if it's $250,000 or more in gross sales, the higher you get up to over a yes. million, you pay LLC fees as well. Hey, is just a minimum. It could and go here, up for sure, yeah. Well, 800 is just a minimum tax. Yes. There's also fees on top of your gross, mm-hmm. which again, people do not discuss right. in the state of California. So I'm like, yeah, that gentleman formed it in Nevada. He formed it in Montana. He formed it in a different state where, yeah, they only pay $25 every other year to have the LLC. So yeah, it doesn't really matter to him, but you live in California. Why well, didn't know all these things? Um, so I agree with you. TikTok it, during COVID, it blew up on this LLC thing. It's still blowing up on the LLC thing. And I'm having to dissolve them left and right because it just doesn't make sense. And they don't realize. They also don't realize in the state of California and in other states that, yes, when you're a sole proprietor LLC, you have to file your individual return as a Schedule C with the LLC. But with the state, you have to file a whole separate form to comply with the LLC regulations mm-hmm. to that state. And so I have so many people that come to me that went to H&R Block or they went and did it themselves or TurboTax and they had an LLC and they didn't they didn't file the form that they the needed to forms, for yeah. the California. And now they're getting letters saying they're in, in, not in compliance yeah. and not, don't even bring me in on business um, licenses or statement of information and then now the BOIs. I'm just talking about tax return forms. So yeah, I, I agree with you. It's There is so much information out there, but is the information pertaining to you and how does it benefit you? And not going to the professional and asking those questions really is going to hurt you. I mean, it costs these people hundreds and hundreds of dollars first to have the LLC, and then it, it costs them hundreds of dollars to pay me to dissolve the LLC. Right. So I agree. So as a tangent, because <laughs> I just got out of tax season, and I, I kid you not, I did I dissolved like 10 LOCs this last tax season. So. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> yeah. that, it just goes to show you there's there's information and, you know, it, just like anything, too much of it is, is not a good thing. Just, I mean, you have too much water and mm-hmm. and not be good for you. So, um, okay. So it sounds like most of your um, marketing is done through social media. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so what are your your handles and that's thank you <laughs> what are your yeah your social media handles that uh so everybody knows me by jazz and finance and it's so funny because like i'll go to like networking events and like not parties because i'm not a partier but like i'll go to like like church events and stuff and they're like you're jazz and finance and i'm like i don't know who you are and they're like, i've been following you i don't have a lot of followers like you're not going to see anything crazy but bakersville is very very small where if you're following right. like, me and amanda have like maybe similar 150 followers and those people are already like well known in bakersfield it is so easy for you to have great connections. So Bakersfield's very, very small. We're mm-hmm. troubles. Um, but yeah. Those are the same people didn't know my name for a while, but they knew Atlas. So they're like, you're Atlas, girl. You're mm-hmm. Atlas. You're mm-hmm. Atlas. And I'm like, I'll take it. I'll take it. It's good branding. It's working. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I like that a lot. It's funny. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we we do this with all of our, our uh, guests we interview, so you won't be an exception, even though you're, you're a colleague. Um, I'll take the first one a minute. If you could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? I definitely want to say for believing in people. 
Um, and I, I'm such a firm believer in that because if somebody didn't believe in me, I wouldn't be here today. It wasn't because I was smart. It wasn't because I was hardworking. Just somebody told me that I could do something bigger than what I was and put that thought in my mind. And sure enough, I, be- I ended up believing in myself. So if I can return even an inch of what Jeremy did for me, like for somebody else, like you can change your life with belief. I think that's probably the answer to the third question is who's your biggest mentor? Jeremy. You guys, <laughs> hopefully you guys will meet him. Jeremy is like my best friend. I mean, I don't know how to say. He's kind of like an older brother he, or an uncle, whatever you want to say. But yeah, he mentors me in so many different areas. I have a coach and I have a mentor. They're very okay. different. Uh, Jeremy's definitely my mentor. He's not my coach. He's not hard on me at all. He's like, you don't hear your goals? It's okay. Like, you're <laughs> so amazing already. But no, I have a, a coach named Raul. Hopefully you guys will be able to meet him too. He's he's a tough cookie. He's very well known in L.A., um, a really, really top financial advisor, but he's really tough on me. He tells me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And Jeremy's like the softy. Um, so you need you need coach and a mentor in life. Good. You need both of those people in your life, though. You need someone who is going to hold you accountable. And that's why I say if those people around you aren't calling at you out on something or trying to better your view, then those are the wrong people that you're working with. Mm-hmm. Um, because you should always be trying to grow and, and be a better version of yourself. Mm-hmm. And you don't want people pleasers who are just saying like, hey, you're doing everything amazing, amazing. No, I, I want to hear how I'm doing it wrong. I want to improve. I, I want to know how I can grow. Like keep telling me. And, and those are the type of people that I strive to be around. It's it's frustrating in the moment when you hear it. And like we were talking earlier before the show, it's like you're, in, you know, you're holding up some of your weaknesses in front of you. But at the same time, that's how you get to the next level of somebody who is going to keep you accountable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely, it's very uncomfortable. But I mean, in entrepreneurship, you get comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And if you're mm-hmm. dedicated to personal growth, like anytime somebody tells me anything different than what I know, it's like I'm thankful for that perspective because I'm not trying to think like, myself i'm trying to think like him and it's it's tough it really is like i'll say something something and he's like pause 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 and he'll like he'll stop the conversation and then he'll like redirect it and i'm like yeah but I, i'm thankful <laughs> yeah. for it because if he i mean he only does it because he cares like he you know just wants the best for me and if i can change my perspective faster and think like him a lot faster in life i'm going to be a lot more successful than i am now and i'm open i'm always open to coaching yeah. and they tell you like are you open to coaching <laughs> and it, you have to give consent like I'm open to feedback. Yeah. So I love it. I'm thankful for it. I wouldn't change anything for it. The last question here is what is the best advice you've ever received? I already knew it, but when I heard it in a quote, I'm like, that makes so much sense as to where I'm at, where I'm at in my life. If you're actually doesn't matter the stage of your life, as long as you have a good understanding of what you don't want in life, every decision you make moving forward becomes easier. I know a lot of people are like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I'm like, you don't have to have it all figured out, but you just have to be very clear on what you don't want your life to look like. If you don't want to be broke, if you don't want to live in the same city, if you don't want to um, stay at the job where you're at, like, just be very clear with what you don't want and, and every day make a decision to get away from that. That becomes very easy versus like, I don't know how I'm, I'm going to make that happen. Like, you learn, you learn and you learn and you learn as time goes on. Yeah. I like the, I like the trial by fire approach. Um, it's difficult, but, but kind of just putting your head down and, and doing it and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to learn. Um, you know, to me, I think that's the best way to kind of get things to sink in. Yeah. And you can't make millions without a couple L's. Mm. There you go. <laughs> I mean, I say that too. The best entrepreneurs are the ones who failed and because they got back up to do it. Um, so I, that's what I always say. Um, it takes, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, learning some life lessons and not always making the best decisions. Um, but then it leaves you at the end of the time where you, you can become the best mentor cause you already learned those life things and now you can pass that along. Um, but yeah, I mean, not everything is always roses and Mm-mm. perfect when you're an entrepreneur, uh, there's mistakes, you lose money, you know, you lose good talent or, um, or you hire the wrong talent, you know, there's all these different things that, you know, can happen in your business. Yeah. That reminds me of the, my, one of my favorite um, like little memes going on about Michael Jordan in his voice. I don't know if you've heard it, but it talks about how many times um, he's failed, right? I mean, Michael Jordan is considered obviously one of the greatest basketball players, if not athletes in, you know, U S professional sports history. And he talks about, you know, I, I've missed 6,500. I don't know the numbers I'm making about, but this many shots I've been entrusted to win the games this many times and I've failed and I, like all these, you know, failures. And then, and then it ends with, because of that, I've succeeded. And then, look at his accolade sense and it you know makes perfect sense so mm-hmm. well jasmine thank you so much for joining us it was a pleasure and anyone who wants to reach out to her the jasmine finance that's mm-hmm. that's the handle 
Yep. And right. you guys can find me here too. Well, yeah. You, oh, yeah. You come <laughs> to our new office, office. 620 <laughs> Millrock Way, but um, most people like to reach out to people, you know, in person mm-hmm. these days. So thanks again for joining us. And it was, it was a pleasure and uh, look forward to talking to you again in the future. Yeah. I loved it. Thanks, so. Thanks, Amanda. The show has been brought to you by the law office of Kyle Jones. Troy Burton with The Lynn Company, CPA John Duffield, Scott Hansen Real Estate Lender, Broker and Investor, Dave Plivlich, President and CEO of the Marcom Group and MarcomBranding.com, and Amanda DiGiacomo, President of Atlas Financial Solutions. You've been listening to the Our Two Cents Podcast. Check out the show notes for links and more information about the show. Also visit our website at OurTwoCentsPodcast.com or catch us on Instagram at OurTwoCentsPodcasts. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share with others.